we, as we can see those two black bucks, hopefully at least one of these, that this rapper Rafiki. So I feel that because Rafiki is lucky that he had males or adult males in the group, I think one of them is going to take over the group. Some group members maybe have already left and gone to Christmas group, but at least the group is stable enough. And I would like to assure the tourists that they shouldn't worry, this group is stable enough. And when they come back to Uganda, they will be able to track Moringo group and see Rafiki's offspring and the rest of the group members. And also, this is a wake up call to support the local communities. You know, the local communities, are, a gorilla has done for them. But for the poacher to even think about killing a gorilla is very sad. And we need to find a way to support the local communities because they're so dependent on tourism. Many of them gave up farming to become, to join the tourism industry. When a porter takes a tourist to track the money they make in one day, their community members would make in one month. And so they thought, why, why farm and dig? It's too difficult. Let me just do tourism. But now that they're not tourists, they're really struggling. So we have to find a way to handle this. And we have to find a way to get um, alternative revenue. It's, uh, it's going to completely come to a halt. There was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, tourists didn't come. DRC tourists got scared. Some didn't come, but some still came. But this time around, when all over the world there are lockdowns, it's even more important to find other alternative means of supporting the local communities. Um, Robert mentioned that in 2011, there was a, that was the last time a gorilla has been killed. Again, it was a playful black buck who was killed. He was used to playing, they called him Mizano, which means playful, in Ruchiga. And he used to play, and this, two, this poacher and a poacher, our team from CTP did a post-mortem and found the same spears that were seen this time when Martin Gorilla Vet Project did a post-mortem. And they like to use the spears, but this same poacher, believe it or not, had ever received a goat from Ua the one who killed the gorilla in 2011. So he had even forgotten about the goat that he had received from Uganda Wildlife Authority. So we have to really think about how we do livelihood activities with the local community and find ways which are really sustainable that stops them even thinking of ever killing a gorilla. Thank you. But I finished speaking. <laughs> yes, I'm trying to see if you like you need to add anything else. Okay. Uh, thank you very, very, very much, Gladys. And uh, of course, we will definitely uh, bring you back to talk about the ecology of the gorillas. A lot of people are very much interested in knowing um, the ecology of the gorillas and especially the behavior with other primates within the area, other members of the ecosystem within the habitat of this area. Because you've been interacting with gorillas for quite some time. And you've been, uh, several times I've seen you myself going with the team to spend most of, most of the time there. Yeah, probably you can give more uh, information about them before we go to John Justin, who's struggling with audios to come in. Can you please come again and talk about this? Thank you very much. Okay, um, yes, the gorillas live in uh, family groups of an average of 10. And they always move together in a family. Uh, they're headed by a silverback normally with uh, many females and some blackbacks, which also come into the group 
and little ones. And it takes about two years to habituate a gorilla group if none of the groups, the gorillas in the group have ever been habituated. But if you find that as in the group are habituated, it takes shorter time. Till you get to five meters, then they stop charging. Gorillas um, tend to live in a harem. They're always together, but sometimes there's interaction between groups when females transfer and or males transfer. And females transfer for different reasons. The males transfer because they can't mate with their father, uh, or they transfer because they're more interested in the other male in the group. And unfortunately, when females transfer with their babies, they get their babies tend to get killed by the the silverback who doesn't want. They only want a, and so we've had some by the other silverback. And in, in Uganda, we have the population is healthy and growing, thankfully. And we're hoping that all the new measures that have been put there by Uganda Wildlife Authority will make sure that even after the pandemic has ended and tourists are coming back, all of these things will continue. People have temperatures taken, they wear masks, and the gorillas will be much more protected. I think I can see JJ's here, but Windy also has chimpanzees. Um, the decision was made not to habituate them because, so Windy has, has the lost monkey, has blue monkey, baboons, rabbit monkeys, rattle monkey. So it's a forest that has a lot, not only the gorillas, also has elephants. So by protecting the gorillas and their habitats, we're protecting all these other animals. The poachers don't come to eat gorillas. In Uganda, people don't eat gorillas. Mm -hmm. um, but they came to eat dika and bush pig. But they set out snares for them. And when they set out snares, gorillas can get caught in the snares and get sick and die. And this is a big problem. But this is even worse now when a poacher gets close enough here. Also illegal. They end up harming the, and so uh, as our NGO CTPH, we've been working there since 2003, improving the health of the communities and their livelihoods and improving the health of the gorillas. And we would like to feel that we've created some community benefits. Even that very village where the poacher comes from in Teko, we work in, and we were so disappointed that you could do this. And we would like to work with everybody else to see how we can continue to improve the lives of those communities so that of Pochila. <laughs> JJ is mine. I think JJ is coming on. Uh, he's still struggling with audios. Uh, when he comes in, we shall move from there. Um, but anyway, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for uh, giving us that insightful information about the behavior of the gorillas. I know we always ask, we always meet uh, so many questions from uh, the people we interact with about the behaviors of the gorillas and how they have been able to live together successfully with other primates in that small forest. But uh, maybe to ask you another question, um, if you still have some time, how about the communities and the challenges you met with you know, this kind of work you've been doing with these gorillas, uh, with the communities around Bwindi, uh, both of course, South, North and East, where they are tracking uh, uh, points. Do you have any challenges with the communities, Dr. Gladys? Uh, yes, um, in the cha the challenges are there in both the northern part and the southern part of Windy. And one big challenge is community banana plants, the, the back of the eucalyptus tree. They can actually also pick up diseases. Like they pick up
which resulted in a baby gorilla dying and the rest only recovered with treatment. And in Kuringo gorilla group specifically had a big scabies outbreak around 2001 to 2000, 2001. Um, and also the Katendejere group actually broke up completely. It was the second gorilla group to be habituated in Windy. And that's the group which we first discovered scabies. In. And this gorilla group, unfortunately, even, and part of them went to DRC and the group lost a gorilla group. And we hope that we won't lose any more. And so the community members are poor. Sometimes they, you know, they come in because they want to continue to poach, to eat dike and bush pig, to collect firewood. And we have to find ways of reducing this by improving their health and improving their livelihoods in a way that is very sustainable. And one other thing that we do with them is we promote, we buy coffee from the farmers bordering the park and to reduce their need to enter the park to poach. And a donation goes to support community health and gorilla health. And I want to thank the tour operators, all of you, and the lodges for buying this coffee, tracking the cross coffee. Park. And we have been able to continue supporting them even during COVID, um, that although the tourists were not coming, we've got buyers from other countries who are able to support them and uh, keep buying this coffee including a distributor in the UK, Money Road Beans, and Pangos in America, and others who are coming up in America, and New Zealand, so, and South Africa. So we have to find ways of continuing to support the communities that is not only dependent on tourism. Tourists are very, very important to sustain conservation, but we need to not only depend on that. You cannot the local communities um, because and they need all the support they can get from the NGOs, the private sector, to be able to keep the communities engaged and away from the forest. <laughs> so how about have I answered all of that yes <laughs> yes yes thank you so much uh of course we we've been to windy with uh some of these things are talking about um have been very obvious we've done a fantastic job in that area uh, uh making the people understand and i'm sure the challenges of the community still go around the poverty lines of the people and uh, sometimes people's personal attitudes because they believe most of the people in windy have understood the importance of the mountain gorillas, but always there will be some groups in the community who would want to sneak into the areas, I mean, to the forest and do uh, uh, the poaching of an hunting animals, because hunting has been with us since times immemorial. So we cannot completely uh, eradicate it. I know some people still go there. We've been hunting ever since we moved into this region and it becomes very difficult, but still I must thank UWA with the team for having managed this area very successfully uh, with reduced uh, poaching, because this is a separate incident and it's not every time that people go out there to kill the gorillas. I know even the hunters who go to the forest understand. They go to look for dikers, they go to look for these small animals, but they understand the importance of the gorillas and of course the legislations or the laws surrounding the gorillas. But I will not go too much into that because the, the gurus are here. Dr. Roy is here. <laughs> There is JJ there. Uh, JJ, I don't know if he's hearing us. Uh, I wanted him to come in and give us his personal experience of what happened, especially to the killing of the the killing of the uh, um, of the silverback in that area. Uh, is JJ? JJ, are you there? JJ, can you hear me, Mr. Tibesigwa? I think he's not hearing us, but this can still go back to Dr. Roho. Dr. Roho, you can give us more. I know you are very, very, very uh, relevant in this, in this topic. You are the person who, actually you and Dr. Kalema would be the people talking about all these gorillas because you are specifically, I mean, by training, doing uh, all sorts of work with these gorillas. So, uh, can you give us a few things? I want you to talk about the 
SOPs that have been developed, probably to give the more light on them. And then uh, later we shall talk about uh, if JJ comes off, you know it about the experience of how this uh, these people were arrested and what's going to happen because I know our colleagues in Europe, our colleagues in South America, they would want to know uh, what is going to happen to these people. What does the law say? Please welcome uh, Dr. Rowe. I think, uh, thank you so much, uh, Herbert, once again. And uh, for those who have just joined in, uh, my name is Robert, as they have said. I'm a senior veterinary officer at Uganda Wildlife Authority. And uh, I think since JJ is not here, I think uh, as a person also almost at the center of this say, gorilla case, I think I, I would make a few comments. And from the start, I want to, I, I, I wish to say that um, this is already a court case of which now most of the matters that are right. pertaining to the case, the details are, are, are now filed with the police and the team that is doing investigation. And uh, you rightly said so, said well when you say that uh, this is really an isolated case which has happened in, in a very long time. This is, and uh, as such, we are treating it as a, a real criminal case. It's, it is not a really livelihood matter because as Gladys said, this person had ever received the goat from Uganda Wildlife Authority. And uh, we tend to think that also much as the, uh, the issue of poaching pressure is there. I think communities around Bwindi, they are really recommendable. They have done a commendable job in terms of conserve, uh, conserve, in conservation, conserving gorillas with us. Because they do understand the importance of tourism. Especially, I think I was with Gladys when we moved around the, during the initial phases of the lockdown. You really see how they are hard hit. They really understand that without gorillas and without gorilla tourism, their lives are, in, are at stake. So they really do appreciate the importance of conservation, especially most of the communities around Windy. So we are taking this up as a real criminal case, and we are collecting enough evidence. We are collecting evidence, and we continue to gather and tie the loose ends of the case to make sure that we come to a conclusive prosecution of this case because the motive much as has been stated as it was killed in the self-defense, but you also understand there was an attempt to, attend, to enter the protected area with, with, a, with the hope of retrieving uh, game meat from the national park. And since this is a person who had ever been reached out to in terms of livelihood programs, so you realize really the intentions were not, they might not have been so much driven by the issues of poverty and the other issues of livelihood. It might be actually the habit of this, uh, of the, of these, of these people to enter the park to look for the, for meat. So, Having said that, it is still a, it's a criminal case. It has it is proceeding within the the legal uh, court sub law, so we don't have so much comment to give on terms of the detail of what has been gathered and what has been not gathered. But uh, be sure that the Uganda Wildlife Authority, together with police and other 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 uh, legal legal entities are taking this case and I think that we are going to come to a successful conclusion. Now, coming to the issue of, um, of the SOPs on how we are proceeding with, uh, with the management of uh, uh, COVID and also what we envision in the future when we open the tourism. As I had already said that um, even before tourism uh, begins, we already doing something, we already have SOPs uh, existing, which our staff are already using in monitoring the health of these, of these gorillas, because you realize these are habituated animals, and the moment we lose sight of them, they can lose their habituation status, but also we would want to know how they are faring even when their tourists are not there. So regional monitoring is going on. And even with monitoring, we are using these uh, standard operating procedures. We are already pre-testing them because you wouldn't want to give tourists something that you have not tested yourself. So 
as a matter of fact, when entering entering parks, any of the parks, we have made a provision for hard washing at the park, at the park entrances, and this will, and actually even our staff, no one is permitted to do the park if you do not adhere to the hand washing, having a temperature taken at the at the gate, and uh, if, if our staff, if, even if your staff, if you do not comply, you are not given access to the to the gate for the staff who are staying outside uh, the parks. And then also, we we have we have now introduced masks in uh, in gorilla monitoring and also masks in gorilla tourism. So that is going to be new to many of, the, of our tourists, but I think they need to prepare themselves uh, in time to know that with COVID, the world has changed. We are not only in the, in the past, the new normal now is that we, we've got now to use masks. And you really know that we should use masks in primate tourism. So, but you, because we understand that the respiratory diseases especially from humans, we have been able to detect them in some of the primates, including gorillas and chimpanzees. So this was a good cue. So going forward, uh, tracking and health monitoring gorillas, we will have masks de deployed to all persons who would be visiting uh, gorillas. And then, uh, of course, these masks, we expect that uh, there will be either N95 masks, which provide sufficient protection, or there will be surgical masks, because also those ones have been proved to provide uh, sufficient protection. Or the, if they are cloth masks, they should be double-layered double cloth masks. And uh, for disposable masks, we expect the any person visiting the, the, the wire, of course, to have extra, at least a pair to be on the same side. Because we expect that the one can either touch the inside of the mask and you'd want to change. Therefore, we we'll expect some, at least a person to come in with a pair of, of masks. And we'll provide, uh, we'll provide, uh, we'll provide, um, uh, opportunities to have these uh, disposable masks being destroyed by ourselves as Uganda Wildlife Authority to make sure that actually we have control of what has gone into the wire and what has come out. So if you go in with two masks, we expect you to hand over the two disposable masks at the end of your viewing time so that they can be sufficiently destroyed. And then... Uh, and Hello, then, good morning. Um, I've been having technicalities here in including or some uh, connected with the bad network signal. I wonder if you're hearing me now. Yes, I think we are hearing you, JJ. JJ. Ah, good morning, ah, Doctor. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Well, that's, just, that's, good morning. That's, that's John Cabot. John Cabot. Yes, I'm, I'm now on air. I've been off because of the bad network signal, but uh, so I didn't actually hear the proceedings. Whereas I would see people speaking, but I would not hear them that much. So I'm sorry, I've missed out on most of the discussion uh, since the beginning. So I, I don't know whether there's any contribution. I will okay. that to, the moderate, to the host to, to bring so you up. Hear, do you hear us now? I... Yes, I'm hearing you. Can I continue? Okay, let's, uh, Dr. Ho first finishes his submission and then we shall call in you, John, to come and uh, give us your experience of the gorillas uh, from the ground where you are right now. So Dr. Ho, please go ahead and, and finish. Okay, and uh, then also, we shall also be screening temperature for tourists who intend to view the gorillas before they go for 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 track for tracking, and this will be done for everyone, regardless of who you are, where you come from. So these are this will be the, the new rules. But again, also for international travelers, uh, before even they even before even they think of entering the forest. One, we expect them to have 
adhered to the to the guidelines and the, the requirements Minister of Health would have put um, up. If if for example they say that you should have spent in the country maybe 14 days, should they continue quarantining people? But if, if they say maybe you present a certificate of testing that you are free from COVID, those are the things that we are going to demand at entrance. Okay. So that we do not uh, have yeah. any, any, we do not take any risk with anyone visiting mm -hmm. these countries whom, whom the Minister of Health has not cleared. And then also we provide regular disinfection and the hand washing facilities at all our points before the tracking, during tracking, uh, during tracking we can provide hands and we shall provide hand sanitizers. And after tracking, we expect everybody to clean up again, be disinfected because some of them might want to leave. So that whatever now has been, uh, if somebody maybe had touched something uh, um, improper in the wild, again, you are disinfected and you leave when you are free. And we expect that uh, together working through these shops with the tour guides, with the tourists together, we should be able really, because all of us, I believe the tourists comes because they love gorillas, they would want to see gorillas. The tour companies, they would take these tourists there because there is also an economic incentive, but also they would want their country to be known. Even us now who are offering a service, we would want these animals to be enjoyed by those who come to see them, but also we would want them to continue to exist. So I would ex expect that all of us, the objective is that we want to keep the gorillas safe, we want to keep them multiplying in their wild, and we want to keep them happy and protect them from the diseases. So I expect that all of us together, working with the tour companies, working to together with the tours, we should be able to protect these gorillas because at the end of the day, these, these animals, mm -hmm. the trust that has been given to us in nature, and we must allow them to continue living happily. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ruho. Thank you so much for this uh, very rich uh, explanation of the standard operating procedures. I know uh, there is a likelihood that the countries are beginning to open up. And if we keep uh, behaving ourselves, we might have a chance of opening up and starting the business so that tourists can start coming to the country. I don't know what will happen, but of course, I have no uh, confirmation on anything regarding that, but we really uh, appreciate that the Uganda Wildlife Authority working with the government have developed the standard operating procedures. The standard operating procedures will make sure that uh, they ensure the safety of the of the animals, the safety of, of us, and the safety of the tourists, which is very, very important, the tourism business. Um, I must once again appreciate all of you for having joined in to listen in and thank you very much and uh, we still have Hirale we, uh, from UK, we had Jen from Arizona and another colleague of mine from Australia but I don't see him now, I think we'll be coming in and we have Vanessa from Canada and all of you guys from Uganda and, and Rwanda and Kenya who are on this platform today. Thank you very much. So can we have now John Justin who is on the ground, who was very much involved in the apprehending of the, in the process to apprehend the people who killed the gorillas. He has a very, very rich experience being on the ground. Um, he's one of the higher rated um, uh, wardens in the area because of his experience of the interaction with the, with the stakeholders, the tourist guides, the tour operators, and of course with the community. Mr. Tibesqua, you are on air now. Please come in. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Vyaruhanga, the moderator of this meeting. Uh, you have ably mentioned my name, John Justice Vestigua. Um, I'm senior warden in charge of the southern mm. section of Windy Impenetrable National. Is that? And I sit mm? here in Inkuringo, mm -hmm. also oversee the entire sector where we have uh, 11 habituated gorilla groups uh, for tourism. Um, mountain gorillas, like all of us know, are quite close to, to humans. Uh, initially, when they are still wild, uh, they tend to stay uh, much inside the park. But on habituation, there's that tendency for them to start staying at the fringes of the park. 
uh, close to where uh, humans actually uh, live. So for that reason, that is why also Uganda Wildlife Authority established a buffer zone in the southern part of the park. And this buffer zone is now actually habitat quite often of some of these uh, gorilla groups. So it is very unfortunate that uh, a gorilla group like in Kuringo, which had uh, 17 individuals, uh, lost uh, um, its uh, lead and only silverback. And uh, we came to uh, identify that it was missing on, on the first and then on the second, that's when we mounted uh, a search for it, only to find it dead. And later on, we discovered that it had been killed because uh, a blunt object had gone through uh, its body, its abdomen. Yeah, we worked uh, a lot, put in a lot of emphasis, and actually apprehended uh, four suspects with the, the ringleader of these suspects uh, called Yamukama Felix. So you might have been told already, or you might be already in the know that uh, these people are read, have read up here before court and they are remanded and the investigations are almost concluded. So we really hope that we, at the end of the day, at the end of the court process, uh, justice is going to be done. So um, we are still monitoring the uh, gorilla group uh, in the area, we have had uh, two viable groups, and that has been in Kuringo and, and then Bushaho. Kuringo has been having 17, but of course, with the death of the silverback, it reduced to 16. We also have had uh, um, a Bushaho, and uh, Bushaho has also been uh, having 11 individuals. We've also had Christmas, but Christmas had fewer numbers, and only up to three. So in terms of viability for tourism, we're looking at Inkuringo and then Bushaho. However, following um, uh, the death of Rafiki, uh, we of course like expected the group is quite unstable, but we are monitoring, but it has interacted with Christmas. Some of the individuals which were in Inkuringo were actually relatives of Christmas group. So as a result, by end of yesterday, we were looking at Inkuringo and the Christmas rebuilding its numbers to eight from three for Christmas, and then Inkuringo reducing its numbers to eight as well. So when you add their Bushaho, if the status quo remains, then we are having again three gorilla groups in Inkuringo area that are viable for tourism. So it is very, very unfortunate but the good thing is that numbers now to eight, which makes it uh, quite viable. Of course, uh, I don't need to emphasize the fact that in Kuringo Group uh, is the foundation of in the entire Southern Tribal National Park. Having initially, uh, it was being led by an old silverback. The old silverback died in around 2008. And then we had the Safari and Rafiki as young silverbacks that took over the leadership of the group. But uh, over time, Rafiki actually fought uh, away uh, Safari, who left the group, and then uh, Rafiki took over. So uh, Rafiki was able to do that with the help of a young silverback called Bahati, but also over time Bahati left and that is the one that formed the Bushaho group, which is habituated for tourism and ranges mainly uh, in Inkuringo area. So um, it is uh, very unfortunate, but uh, we hope that uh, uh, Rafiki will not go in vain. I don't know if there's any specific uh, uh, area you would want me to talk about as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, JJ. That is the fantastic information that everybody has been yearning to know about. And I can hear you know every individual's name. That is, that is 
hilarious. There are very few people who can do that, and we really appreciate that. Uh, do you have any challenges with the community so far? Because I can see from the comments here, people are saying that uh, they need more. They, we need to do more. Uh, we need to do more of uh, mobilization. We do more sensitization. We do more uh, that people are supposed to be given uh, food supplies because of the lockdown that they are not earning from the gorillas and therefore they are not they are not happy. Any plans? Oh, first give Any me. Plans? My phone is. Yeah, thank Any you very Mr. Moderator, uh, yeah. I, I must say generally that uh, I've worked in uh, several protected areas, but uh, I must say that uh, the community around Bwindi Impenetrable National Park in general, and definitely the community around the Nkuringo area in particular, is very, 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 very supportive of conservation. And uh, they hold these mountain gorillas in very, very high regard and they, they work hand in hand with Uganda Wildlife Authority in Bwindi to conserve mountain gorillas and the entire park. Uh, we are in partnership with the, a number of uh, entities, a number of stakeholders, and one of them actually is the, the community of Nkuringo under their umbrella organization called Nkuringo Community Conservation and Roman Foundation. We manage and own the buffer zone together. The community receives a lot of benefits from tourism. They receive uh, a lot of money uh, from revenue sharing that is generated from tourism. But most importantly, the community here is involved in various tourism businesses. The community owns a lodge where the people work, where the community uh, earn bed nights, and this money supports a lot of community development projects in this area. They have been able to build schools, they have been able to build health centers, they have supported education for children in this area, and they have supported a lot of livelihood activities, just like the money from tourism revenue uh, has also done. The people here operate several other lodges, they operate restaurants, others are porters who carry the the luggage of tourists, others are actually employed by Uganda Wildlife Authority. So in whichever business that is related to tourism that the community gets involved in, actually they earn a lot of money. So nonetheless, you'll always have uh, a rotten apple or so within the basket. So I must say that this is one of those very few bad people, bad elements within the community. We cannot take the entire community to community. Just that you, in every community, you are likely to have one or two people or a few who are actually wrong people. Nonetheless, we still need to engage these community members. Lockdown is here. It is very, very true that the community here is worst hit now that there is no tourism. And uh, we need to find ways of intervening and ensuring that uh, we reduce on the negative effects of the COVID-19 to the community. Fortunately, like I've already told you, we work with the, the community under the umbrella organization of NCCDF, that is including uh, Community Conservation and Foundation. The tourists who have been here before, all of them are in touch with us. They have made the significant contributions to the community of this of this area through incurring uh, or community conservation and enrollment foundation. So uh, because of that contribution, a lot of contributions from former tourists to especially the southern sector, most of the community members here have been given food, uh, posture, uh, rice, beans have all been distributed, especially to those who are most vulnerable. And that is the women who are breastfeeding, the elderly, uh, 60 and above, um, the katiches, religious leaders generally who rely on offertories from the parishioners, the porters themselves, the support staff have been given uh, support in form of food. And this kind of support is actually uh, continuing. But this is the short term and these handouts definitely uh, are not sustainable, but we are also still working with partners. <laughs>
involved in many other livelihood projects so as to diversify and have alternative livelihood beans. And one of them is actually uh, the plan that we have with the NCCDF to, to give seed for some of the crops that uh, grow very well in this place so that the community can grow some of these uh, crops so that the, as tourism is still struggling, then they are able to earn uh, a livelihood. Uh, but uh, also we are trying to find ways of engaging the community directly as Uganda Wildlife Authority. We are trying to integrate more, much more than ever before, uh, the community in the management uh, of the park. There are activities that we normally carry out uh, like uh, slashing of the boundaries, like manipulation of the buffer zone, like maintenance of um, the Mauritius zone, like maintenance of the trails. We want to get these communities, the, mo the local communities in this area, and especially those whom we are very sure that have been uh, almost entirely dependent on tourism and which is not there now, so that these people at the same time are able to earn a living. We have started a, and rejuvenated the program again of synthesizing, sensitizing the communities, especially the frontline families uh, to the park, because these are the people who sometimes sneak into the park and lay snares and uh, then keep on checking on these snares. And as they go to check on these snares, that is how actually we got a very bad scenario like we had about the death of Rafiki. So we want to engage these people the more, we want them to go to school, we want them to implement uh, a number of livelihood projects, and we also want them to be engaged in the various park management activities from which they can earn money and then be in position to meet their needs. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, JJ, uh, for that um, very, very insightful information about what uh, is happening on the ground. Uh, members, on the, uh, members in the members in, in, in the meeting, please, if you are not talking, please mute your microphone so that we don't have echo coming through uh, to disorganize others. Oh, anyway, uh, having said that, um, we really appreciate Uganda Wildlife Authority for this tremendous job. You know, sometimes people think it is easy uh, to organize communities, but I am very sure Uganda Wildlife Authority has done a fantastic job because I know these areas many, many years ago, they are really, really very primitive areas and people didn't really want to get out of there, you know, get into the communities to do anything there. But Uganda Wildlife Authority has been there for all these years, having done a successful job to habituate all these uh, animals. From the panel, from the discussants and members in the house, I'm getting some questions here. And this, I think, is uh, dedicated to uh, Dr. Kalema. I don't know if she's still available here. Um, yes, I can see Dr. Gladys is still there. The question is, is there any difference between uh, windy gorillas and volcano gorillas? Is, is there any genetic uh, or DNA tests that, that have been carried out to show the differences in these mountain gorillas? There's been an argument all the time. We've seen flyers going around the, the East African region. The other day, I picked them from Nairobi. They are saying they are different gorillas. Please, uh, can you come forward and clear this and tell us where it belongs? Thank you. Dr. Kalema, do you hear me? Dr. Kalema is not coming. Okay, I'll take this question to uh, Dr. Roho. He's well suited to answer this. People are asking questions from the discussion uh, on this platform that is there a difference between Bwindi gorillas and uh, uh, volcano gorillas? I, it has been on and on and on. I need maybe you come forward and uh, make a clarification on uh, which one falls where. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, 
And I, I think this began uh, in, um, I think from the publication by- I'm back again. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. I think the moderator will help us and see. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Kalema, do you hear you? Are you on? Dr. Kalema, are you on? Maybe I go on, then she can supplement. Okay, you go on, she will support first later. She will start, this, support later. I think this issue began with uh, with an issue with of, of the, by the publication by Thomas Botensky, uh, who actually was, uh, Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yes, who was actually disputing... Uh, sorry, my... But uh, just... I'm Dr. stuck, Madureta. Maybe you first mute. Dr. Right? Kalema, Dr. Kalema, let's let us first hear Dr. Roho, then you will come in later. Do you get me? Dr. So Kalema, I, you wait for Aruho to go on and then I'll, I'll allow you in after Dr. Roho. Go ahead, Dr. Roho. I think I think this began with a, with a, with a publication by Thomas Abotensky. Who, who, erroneously, who erroneously actually thought the Roland gorillas were the same as mountain gorillas. But I think to make such an assertion, it must be based on, uh, on the genetic composition of the animal and you look at how they, they are full genome compare. And when you will do compare all these, um, the, genome, the genome sequences, for example, for a Roland and mountain gorillas, they also differ. And also morphologically, their outward appearance, when you look at them, they are different. When you look at the, for example, the size and the nature and the shape of the head, you really, you really see these, these two animals are different. So it is not, True that these animals, yes, all of them are gorillas, but these are these are two different uh, animals when you look at them, uh, both physically but also genetically. So it is not true that the 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 the, the, the Gwini, Mugahinga gorillas um, are not uh, the same um, as mountain gorillas. These are mountain gorillas. Roland gorillas are in the in the Central Africa, in the Congos and the and this. And other area uh, and uh, it, it, well, within Central Africa, but uh, Bwindi, Magahinga, and, and within uh, Virunga Massif, we are having mountain gorillas. So I think I think that is an an erroneous. It can it can be created a political non-informed campaign, but it isn't doesn't add anything really scientifically. Mm. Okay, um, that is very good. Thank you very much. And I think Dr. Kalema can go ahead and add on um, what you have to say about the differences, if there are any differences between uh, Bwindi gorillas, uh, mountain gorillas, and probably the, the Roland gorillas. Please, Dr. Kalema, go ahead. Yes, um, just to add on to what uh, has said, which I think he covered most of it. Uh, you can either classify gorillas according to the way they look or their genetics. But if you classify the gorillas according to genetics, the Bwindi gorillas are exactly the same as the Birunga gorillas, and they're classified as mountain gorillas genetically. A scientist called Oliver Ryder, Dr. Oliver Ryder, did this analysis about those days when they used to say that there is only 200... Mm -hmm. doctor, you are losing you, doctor. About two. The Native Mountain Gorillas, because of mm -hmm. only counting the Virunga Gorillas. But then, you see, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Go ahead. 
Who is this? Can you? Is it? Okay. Uh, I was just saying that the, the number of mountain gorillas used to be less than 300 when they were only considering Virunga gorillas as mountain gorillas. But now the number of mountain gorillas doubled when in 19, around 1987, they discovered the Bwindi gorillas were exactly the same genetics as the gorillas in, Bui, in Virunga. And that's when Uganda was able to say that we have mountain gorillas and the numbers doubled to 600. So the, the genetics is exactly the same. They may look slightly different because the altitude is different. Uh, the ones in Virunga have longer hair because they live at a higher altitude and they don't eat as much fruit because they don't have as many trees, but they're actually exactly the same. And if you notice even the gorillas in the higher parts of Bwindi like Ruhija are slightly, look a bit different from the ones in Buhoma just because of the altitude. And that's what determines, you know, they have longer hair when they live in colder places. There was actually uh, somebody called Esteban Samiento who worked with Tom Lutinsky who wanted to call the gorillas after himself. He wanted to call them Gorilla, Gorilla Samiento. Can you believe it? <laughs> he, want, he thought he had discovered a new species of gorilla. And uh, remember we were with Dr. Liz McPhee from International Gorilla Conservation Program. He wanted to actually go to the place where I know you're coming. We, are, we, lost, we have lost you again. Are you there? Gurus is bones. And Liz told me he knew that he couldn't go any closer. And he even had, these are not real mountain gorillas, you know, writing something to Swara. Why? Okay. Uh, Dr. Gladys, you are disappearing. Okay. I think she's struggling with the with the um as Robert said. The genetics are shown that the Bindi gorillas are mountain gorillas. So, I think going to I think I think you can do only audio. Not the look, but according to and distinctly different. <laughs> okay, you can hear me. I think you can only do audio. Uh, you remove the video. Uh, so that yeah, I think that's good. all. Abu, did you want me to say anything? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm here. you are still going on. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, no, no, network. No. Network is not on. Okay, uh, I want to thank everybody for for listening in. Although in some spots we have got uh, problems of signals, but we are still going ahead. There are some questions here and observations. I think Dr. Rowe is uh, uh, very interested in knowing okay. this. Okay. Yeah, the information about the recovery of the gorilla. To say. Gladys, uh, you're not, you not coming through. Uh, your network is uh, a little bit uh, difficult. Um, okay, so let's have, um, I think the, I will send this to Dr. Roho, that uh, the information about the recovery of the gorillas, the information about the community direction of how they, are, they, they have been working together like uh, JJ was talking about, it should be coming out in the media. This has come from UK. Another person has just sent in my inbox uh, from, from Canada. That the same thing that people don't know out there about this. It should come in the media, it should be in the publications 
on our websites, on everybody's website, the success story of the gorillas. People want to know this. So I think you are taking notes about it. And I'm happy that you have even gone ahead to, to, to actually clarify because uh, somebody from uh, Rwanda and from Kenya was asking about the differences in gorillas. Because some people are claiming that the gorillas in Buindi are different from the gorillas in, in Mgahinga, in the Virungas, or that area. That, that's fantastic, it has been cleared. And I love that, thank you very much. But uh, I, will be, I will be picking more questions now. It's very good to start asking questions. You can send them on the chat. Of course, I will not answer all the questions, but whichever questions have come, I will pick them up and put them down and share them with the people. Um, before I allow Dr. Aruho to come in and maybe talk about this uh, uh, request that we should have this information in the media, I would like to allow uh, Ndorere Eric, he's one of the senior guides in this country, uh, who'd like to ask a question. I don't know who is asking now, but Ndorere, please come through. Ndorere, please unmute and ask your question. Unmute and ask your question. <laughs> Dorele, please unmute and ask your question. No, his technology is, is catching up with him. Dorele, please unmute and ask your question. Okay, uh, he's not unmuting, unmuting. Anyway, let's go to uh, Dr. Ho. Uh, you had about this request that which the, the developments of the communities around the gorilla area, uh, how they how the Uganda Wildlife Authority has been supporting them and the gorilla recovery. You know, it's very, very important, like what uh, JJ was talking about, what's happening in Nkulingo now. There's been a big worry that now the silverback is gone. What's going to happen to this, uh, the, the entire family? What's going to happen with the black bus? Are they taking over? Is, is, is another group coming to take over? And then another request is that can we have maybe young people, the children around the communities, taken into the park during the, uh, during the free times? They can look at these animals and appreciate them so that they appreciate when they are still young. Uh, do you have something to talk about this, Dr. Ro? Please come through. Unmute and come through. Unmute again. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm glad that all these, uh, you know, the, the beauty with uh, this discussions like this, you know, they, they, only make, they can only make us better. And you know, all these ideas that are coming through, these are ideas real that we needed because when you look at the conservation history where I've been coming from, we are coming from a history whereby to start conservation and move, the, move where we have been moving. It was either the barrel of the gun to make sure that the, the wrong guys are kept out because of our history as Uganda because the decimation of the white life in the 1960s where we are now was largely due to poaching. So the first thing was to deal, to deal away with the bad guys and start creating community relations. And along the way now, these are the successes that now we are talking about with white life numbers increasing, gorillas coming from 200 now busting over 1,000. So these are, the, these are the stories and I think you rightly point it out so that we really need now to, you know, make this uh, public. We need to let people know that actually they have played a huge role for the recovery of wildlife, other than contributing this all effort to increase the reinforcement and the peace and security that's been existing in our parks. Because going forward in the future, conservation is conservation is communities. Without communities, we cannot we cannot move far. So I think, yes, you, you, you say it right when you say that we, again, we give the community this feedback that actually they have done a very good job in conserving these species. I think this is a positive that I'm taking on from here. And this is something that I'm going to share with the, with, with the UWA so that you know these positive public words of affirmation, we give it to the community that yes, you have done a very good job and we can appreciate it. You can see the numbers are going high and this we couldn't do without you. So I think, yes, we are going to pursue this line of thought because also a positive message to the community, it, en it enhances our relationships with them because they will also feel appreciated and then they will also have that positive stimulus to work with us and do better. So this one I'm taking it on. Then concerning the children, you know also there is a minimum age which a, a person can go on to, to, view, to view the gorillas. So somehow, somehow, 
introducing young children to visiting Guadira parks might be a little bit uh, challenging. But uh, generally speaking, we have those uh, education programs where children are coming to school at even a very, of coming from school to, to visiting national parks at a very subsidized rate. I think uh, how about you have witnessed this, for example, in the Kumburo, with all those buses feeding children to school. And that will not stop. And actually we are doing it more, more, more. like uh, not related to, to the gorillas, like what we are doing in a giraffe, for example, in, in, in the Kumburo. We are introducing children to come and see giraffes, which they have not seen in the area for almost a hundred years. So this is creating a, a positive stimulus and that is that will help us actually introducing these young uh, these young children to conservation at an early age, and by that would we'll actually be eliminating these seeds of poaching from germinating in their lives, and it will also help them to embrace wildlife as they are, as theirs at an early age. With that sense of ownership, we believe they should be able to own this wildlife and be good stewards to its conservation. So. The issue of children, it is it is being catered for, and it will continue being catered for. But for gorillas, as I said, we there is a major restriction which we are dealing with, so that uh, I think now for ten years. But after that, after I after I think uh, I, I think about fifteen years, you are able to visit gorillas. But as lower lower ages, it is not advisable to introduce these children to gorillas because. Because of obvious fact, you don't want to risk them to injuries. You don't want to risk them to such a hard terrain in which they cannot manage at that tender age. But that said, we our our children education programs in all national parks they continue working and uh, and the kids are, are always welcome to visit the national parks. Thank yes. you. I don't know if I answered everything you asked. You brought it very well. Thank you, Doctor, for answer such a questions. Thank you very, very much. But from the tourism uh, business where I come from, this approach is going to create very big results. If you look at the future generation, we've been talking about domestic tourism. And our argument has always been, this is a complex, a complex, complex matter that we need to handle carefully. But if we target the young people, you're targeting the young people to make them appreciate our, our, our products, our activities, they become towards later. But if we only touch the adults, the adults have already had their share of, of, of the experiences. They may not necessarily become domestic tourists for a long time. But if you touch the young people and put the, uh, uh, inculcate the love for, for, the, for, the, for the wildlife in them, for nature in them, for touring, and the reason why one should have a holiday, it will make a difference in our drive to develop domestic tourism. I must welcome also uh, colleagues from uh, Avitourism Colombia. They are with us. Uh, the two operators from Belgium, I see Mark here, and our colleagues from Kenya, the chairman of uh, Kenya Professional Safari Guide Association, uh, Paulo Kiri. And we have got somebody from Namibia. We have people from Rwanda here joining us. And this is fantastic. Uh, we still have about 25 minutes to go. And uh, I would definitely Take the, 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 the open the discussion to the audience, please. If you have any questions, uh, please say uh, put up your hand and you come in with a question. But before you do that, I want to bring this again to Aruho. There is from the chat room. Someone says um, the, the 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 share the revenue sharing the revenue sharing. I don't know if you have something to talk about it, Mr. Aruho. The revenue sharing is not appropriate. That is sent to the district and the district people actually uh, mismanage it and ends up in a, a not, not doing what's supposed to be doing. I know it was a big concern and the government has been, uh, I was actually involved with the people who are complaining about it and the government has been doing some work about it. I don't know how far you have gone, but I know it was going very well. Maybe you can throw more light about it because I know it was being solved. Go ahead. The issue of revenue sharing, it, was, it has also been really, um, it's one in our fresh as Uganda Wildlife Authority because you see as park managers and wildlife managers, you really want, would want to make impact at, a, at, at, a, at the interface and you'd want to create that synergy with those revenues, with the work that we are doing. 
because people who are affected by wild by 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 wildlife conservation activities at the at the park interface, you are not benefiting from the project. And another issue was accountability of the resources entrusted through the revenue sharing scheme. But now the good news is that now with the new Wildlife Act 2019, that has been addressed. This money now will be sent out in the form of a grant and the Uganda Wildlife Authority retains the responsibility of supervising those projects and also even withholding more funds if you do not use the grant very well. So I think there is a very good hope in the new Wildlife Act and the regulations that are being worked on to make sure that the, wild, the, 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 the revenue shared at the park uh, uh, with, the, with the communities around the park, they make impact and meaning to the people who are affected by the wildlife. So this is where, where located for in the, in the new act and the regulations are now being worked on, which I believe will be operational soon. And then people shall start seeing the impact of these revenues that are remitted to the local governments sharing boundaries uh, with the parks. I hope that uh, oh, clears. That, uh, that is now clear because the, 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 the person asking the question has uh, understood exactly uh, what, what is happening today. I was actually one of those who are very, very bit about it because, you know, I come from the uh, areas around the Elizabeth National Park and they wanted yeah. there to be some seriousness about where the money goes and what it does so that eventually the community appreciate what uh, the, the money does for them because they will receive quite a big chunk of money and they should see the results. And that's what we used to sell when we are attracting people to come there. Uh, there was another question which came in my inbox, uh, Dr. Hall. I think this one goes to you again. Uh, this one is from a tour operator. That why, why can't the Uganda Wildlife Authority have the seasons for two operators, specifically two operators and tourist guides going to the park and do the gorilla tracking at either you know, an understanding of either free entrance or something like that. I don't know if you have to say this now, it is your area, but I know it is for the part of business, but as a senior level, you can be able to respond to this. They would want to have like, uh, this is a scheduled time. Every quarter we have got 100 or 50 tour guides going to see the gorillas, to have the experience, the tour operators are going, hoteliers are going, because the value chain has got quite a number of people. Please come ahead and respond to that, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I think that uh, will require making more interfaces with Uganda Wildlife Authority. And that is something I cannot give a straightforward answer at this moment, because I know that person asking that question really knows what is supposed to be done. I think more interface with Uganda Wildlife Authority could answer that question. Very much. We shall definitely look. I was expecting Doc, uh, Mr. Masaba to come on board, and I think uh, if he's, he finishes the meeting, wherever he is, he's going to join us, and this question will be directed to him. I have Dixon with a question, please. Dixon, go ahead and ask your question. Unmute and ask your question. Dixon Newman. Dixon. Yes. Yes. Please. Uh, yes. Thank you, Herbert. Uh, I'd say it is a pleasure being uh, on this platform. Uh, I've been able Dixon to... Newman, you are on air? Yes, I am. Are you able to hear me? Yes, Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. So I was saying that it has been really a great honor. Uh, I've had you know, uh, different submissions from, from JJ and from Dr. Gladys and Dr. Aliho. I would say my, my major concern is, is about the communities as we have the topic today about you know, the gorillas and all that. But we have had also, you know, big challenges, especially, you know, when it comes to conservation. Uh, previously, when the thick was killed, I was able, you know, to go around and, and read some information that we have out there. Like we are saying, uh, I think about major, major platforms and major news, uh, news channels and magazines were able to write about the same thing. So literally, the information that we have that is going out there is definitely negative information. So I would say like you have suggested, at least let us, let us have the best information, maybe the good information that maybe people are doing what they can out there so that you know, other people get to know the other side of the story. Because the comments I was reading, Uganda, we are not doing well. Of recent, when we had, when we are, when Nat Geo, uh, Nat Geo was airing the, the, the documentary about the, the tree climbing lions, 
at the end of at the end of the of, of the video which was shot i think around uh, maybe 2010 2012 they brought out this information that in 2018 or 2017 these these lions were killed so literally we are not doing uh, we are not doing good with our publications and, and what people are putting out there my my major question here is uh, i would direct it to to dr aliho is that as much as we have that percentage that we are giving to the communities. Right now, we are supposed to, to re-evaluate our policies. Maybe you, you, you're bringing out this contribution at the end of the year. Can we be able to have this contribution in this time where people need it the most, that no one is even earning a single coin? Can UWA or any part of the government be able to say, look, these people hit hard. Can this money be able to come out right now so that we can buy food or we can buy supplies to these other people? Can, this, can we evaluate some of these policies and then we see how it all goes? So I think that would be my question. Thank you very much, Herbert, and thank you, Dr. Ali. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> I know Dr. Ali will have an answer, but it could be, it could be a long time for the, they first collect the money and then give it out, but at the end of the year. But maybe Dr. Ali has an alternative answer to mine, but uh, I want to appreciate uh, Dixon uh, for what you have done, but I want to also uh, contribute to you that we, in some areas we don't do well, but I can say that, like uh, I hear uh, said earlier, we need to put more information online, our good information, development of the gorillas, the recovery, the recovery of the gorillas should be online, should be on our websites, should be on our, on our blogs, so that people can see it out there, not only for the community, but also for the outside community all over the world. So, uh, Dr. Ho, please come and talk about this. I respond to Dixon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dixon. I think, you know, one of the things that he interests me so much, you know, when I look at Dixon, he, he looks almost, uh, we almost age mates cross, all, all cross there. And, you know, when we see us, the youth taking up uh, these uh, presses and rising points of concern, you know, it highlights the, that the future is bright and it's good that you are getting interested in these issues at such a, such a time like this. Coming to your question, I think, yes, of the narratives, yes. I think there's no better ambassador who can talk about the issues of Uganda, like us Ugandans. It's us to put those stories to be believed because we are living the real experience. So in the issue of the narrative, yes, we have to put the better experience and talk the truth about what we are seeing because the stories that we are having as a country, these are very, very tremendous positive stories that we need them, we need to be out there. So not one incident of killing 11 lions should overshadow the good that is happening here. So I I I, I believe you there, and we we are the ambassadors. On the issues of, of supporting communities, I think before COVID. Before COVID, we had really sent out to, I think around wind, we distributed the billions of shillings just the, uh, late last year. So as far as we talk, as we are talking about to issues of revenue uh, disbursement to, to, to those communities, we have already done our, 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 our job. And at the moment, our basket seems to be empty. <laughs> so, but, as you know, it's a statutory obligation. Every correction, even in this, even in this crisis, every twenty percent that will be corrected at the gate still will come to the community. So that one, we, there is no way we can hold it. There's no way we can deny them. It is their right. So be rest assured that we'll continue doing our our obligation, even in a even in the midst of a crisis like this, because by law we are mandated to do so. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Well, that's the fantastic one. Uh, I have a question from Mark Frederick in Belgium. Please, Mark, uh, go ahead. Mark is a tour operator. He brings the hundreds of tourists here every year. Please, Mark, go ahead and ask your question. Your hand is up. Hello, Hello Habat. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. No, uh, thank Habat, I appreciate you for this platform of bringing experts, uh, the Dr. Zaliho and Dr. Gladys uh, to share us with their 
uh, with their rich knowledge. Well, basically, my question goes to the, the the doctors, those experts. I know they have done a lot of a lot to teach out or to get to the people about the gorillas, about conservation and uh, the behaviors. But I don't know. I think this will go to Doctor Alho. Uh, if who is thinking of coming out with a a gorilla scent of excellence, because we're finding that bringing out the clients. With uh, the guides to drive them to all, to different sectors, they get inf some information from guides. Then the briefing from the rangers. Then they go and they do the tracking of one hour. But mostly, some some you know knowledge is power. We need we need our tourists to come back when they have learned about what is about the gorillas. Because one one of the clients asked me one time, do gorilla get menopause? I was so green about that. And most of the guys don't know that. And we don't know the psychological uh, impact of the gorillas, the morphological part, the physiological part. So something, I know more of research have been done, more of, uh, researches, uh, more conferences, more things have been put in place. But we want also to enrich our tour guides, more information about the gorillas in terms of a scientific way approach. Even the clients themselves, those who come earlier in different sectors, like in Bohoma, they have three days or two days there. Can they get that more information rather than living with just a mere briefing from the rangers and the mere uh, guide explanation whereby they can come out and know I've been to Uganda, I've done the gorillas and I can tell about how the gorilla is being born, the months, how they behave. I don't know if there's any arrangement who has done towards that or creating a, a sense of excellence. Thank you so much, Abad, for everything you're doing. I appreciate. Moderator, you want me to continue yes, and yes, answer? Yes, thank you Mark's very, question? very much. And uh, of course, yes, you can answer that. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I think. Uh, Go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Mark raises really uh, pertinent um, issues, and actually, then there are issues of innovation, and. Uh, I think last year I had an opportunity to go to Namibia. I was invited by the Namibian government to go and capture some animals. So they took me to the Cheetah Conservation Foundation. And at the Cheetah Conservation Foundation, they have exactly what Mark is describing as a, a center of excellence. Actually, Mark, what is he trying to imply is he means a center of excellence, but for information sharing. Like the way we have information sharing centers, but this is an, 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 an information sharing center that enriches the tourist experience in terms of providing information other than tourism, but again, knowing much more about gorilla conservation. I think this is a very, very bright idea, and I'm going to uh, share with our tourism colleague, because one of the reasons why you see like tourism in Southern Africa is taking a, va a far greater trajectory is because of that enriched tourism experience. You do not only see animals, but you come with much more knowledge than you had ever known before you took your tour. So I have noted your idea and I'm going to share it with our, with our, our business development team because we, we, we have these information centers in, in all these areas right now. For example, Windy, they have a new structure the visitors briefing center that can be taken advantage of and actually impregnated with those information materials and which people now can take time as they are taking their coffee after after tracking or before tracking they can get more information and also it also helps us to remove ambiguity in guiding i don't know if you people have had an experience whereby you go with a guide, but he's trying to tell you something, but he's not sure about, and you also don't know how to consult. Hmm? So with having such a resources in, uh, in our infrastructures, especially briefing centers and uh, our information sharing centers, 
you rightly say so that really they are going to enhance our visitors' experience. I'm going to share it with our business development team. And this is a very good recommendation from you, Mark. Thank you very much. That is fantastic. Uh, thank you, Mark, for raising up such a fantastic question. And of course, I would be happy to see uh, Uganda producing uh, doctors, PhDs on gorillas. Like, you know, we have like four, five, and they speak with authority. So that gorilla track becomes uh, more than exciting, but with information, rich information about, if you talk about behavior, we go in the details. You're looking at even counting the, the toes, you know, looking at what, if Gorilla does this, what does it mean, you know? Give us more information so that our guides can always have sessions. We'll be having even guides telling us now on this platform about a lot more uh, the gorilla, on the Gorilla behavior. That would be fantastic. I have a request, Dr. Sevide, uh, Dr. Sevide, uh, Bernard, Dr. Bernard Sevide, he is one of those experienced and highly profiled uh, veterinary doctors in this country. He wants to uh, also talk about the uh, the COVID, the impact of COVID on this uh, EPS. If it is uh, there, Doctor Sevide, please. Are you online? Yeah. Yes, oh, yes, I ahead. am. <laughs> ah, I'm thank you, Abad, you Thank, thank you, Abad, for organizing this great show. Uh, just uh, this is Bernard Sevide, a veterinary doctor working with the Gorilla Doctors. So we have been. Uh, working with Ikua, managing the health of mountain goyas for very, very many years, and also work in Rwanda and Congo. But I want, first of all, to appreciate Ua in a way that, and I want everybody to know that because of the significance of the mountain goyas, whatever happens to the mountain goyas in terms of health is a key priority, and Ua appreciates that and does that. So even when Rafiki died, I want everybody to know that every gorilla day, is always investigated to the board. In other words, Rafiki died, Rafiki was killed, uh, Ua investigated, post mortem was done. And that's what helped Ua to know that this death was actually not natural. And, that's, and for that, we want to commend Ua to understand that because the post mortem is showing something as sinister about this death. They are able to investigate and come to the core cause of that, and that's really, really, very much appreciated. So, in as much as uh, poachers will be there, reinforcement will be there, but the ability for Ua to investigate to a logical conclusion of these instances is what I want to commend Ua for, and really wish uh, all other government agencies, all different departments, to be able to do. Now, regarding COVID nineteen, just for information, things are never going to be the same again. Whoever thinks that we are going to go, to go back to normal sooner, I think that's not true. We are, it's going to take us a while before we are back to normal because of COVID-19. We know that mountain goyas are equally susceptible to many human diseases. And for that, we are extremely worried about what the impact of COVID, just like Ebola or any other disease could be if it went to mountain goyas. We have seen cases in many West African countries where, mount, where gorillas, not mountain gorillas, but lowland gorillas and chimpanzees and other primates have been decimated by diseases like Ebola, like anthrax, like a pneumovirus infectious disease. So for us, any infection that happens in the gorillas is equally interesting because we want to safeguard this small population to guard it from any potential disaster. So for tours in Cleopen in the Great Ape Parks, People should be aware that all other recommendations, the health recommendation regarding sanitation, regarding preventive measures for any chance, slim chance that COVID can get to mountain goyas have to be completely minimized or as minimized as possible. The same goes to the porters. If, if, if tourists are going to come to track gorillas and if there are going to be a recommendation, for example, for people to have tested for COVID as twice, then don't expect that this person who has tested negative and is coming to trouble well, is going to be assisted by a porter whose status is not known. So it means there is a long way to go before Ua probably is going to accept that tourism in great websites resumes in a normal way. It's going to take quite a lot of planning and thinking and, think, and things are going to be done differently. Think about social distancing. The same is going to apply. You normally have a, a party of tourists rangers, porters, guards, 
escorting towards seagoers in a group of about 30 or so. And what are the social distancing guidelines? How do they apply in such a situation? So let us think ahead of time. We are going to recommend, and we continue to recommend, that any measure that needs to be in place before we go to see goiters is going to be put in place because we cannot risk testing how COVID can be if it goes to mountain goiters. So I think everybody should know mountain goiters are primates, they are infectious, susceptible to infectious diseases just as humans, and therefore all the preventive measures that are current, even stopping schools and churches and bars from reopening cannot allow Goya tours to reopen the same way. It's going to be different and we better get prepared for that. So I want to recommend Ua for that, that they have opened other parks, but they are cautious before they reopen tourism in great air parks that all of these are taken into consideration. And I think the earlier we talk about these are stakeholders, the better and I think it will really pass by. So thank you, Albert, for organizing this and for allowing some of these voices to come out. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bennett. I have, I have not seen you for quite a long time. I, I didn't know you are still hiding yourself with gorillas over there. <laughs> in fact, uh, to inform you with Dr. Rojo and Gladys, in our trainings of the guides, uh, we have already agreed that in the next sessions, each session that we have, we shall be inviting you to come and uh, share your experiences with wildlife so that the, 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 the tourist guides have got more information about uh, what happens with these animals from the real people. So you are part of us, as usual, I always invite you to come and be with us. Uh, yes, I must remind you that we, we, have, we have about 10 minutes to go. And of course, I must thank all those who are with us from Kenya, from uh, the African continent, from uh, South America, from Canada, from Europe. I don't know if Hira has something to say. She's been putting up a really fantastic contribution on the chat room. Uh, Hira, do you have something to say on this? Do you want to say something? Because we want to hear from you. You are a very good representative of the people who come from Europe to come and see the gorillas here. And you've been there, you came in time, you've been very attentive, you've been taking notes. Uh, do you have something you want to say? People want to hear from you. Come forward, please. Unmute and unmute, please. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very. Thank you very much, Herbert. It, it, and thank you very much for this really, really interesting talk. It uh, highlights so much positive work that is going on right now, and uh, people need to know about this. I think my po main point is people who are your visitors and who are sitting in Europe and the US and Australia, unable to leave their countries at the moment, uh, uh, hopefully very soon, um, are very keen to travel. We are fed up with being at home and we want to get traveling again. Uh, we can't yet, uh, we may not be able to for a number of months, I anticipate. I hope to get out somewhere by about November. Uh, I cannot see it before that from the UK. We've had a, a very bad uh, COVID and we are working hard to reduce it, but people want to travel. Europe is, uh, when I say Europe, I mean continental Europe to me. Uh, uh, they are slightly ahead of us on the COVID uh, path. And I think you'll find visitors from uh, France, Germany, etc. cetera, will get to Uganda before we can, but uh, it, everybody's anticipating it don't imagine people don't want to come. They also know that um, Africa in general has had um, comparatively little disease. Uh, there's been some very successful resistance and, and programs to prevent it building. And um, that is going to be a very, very big advantage to Africa in general, because people will be looking at every country to see what the pattern is like there and whether they feel safe to go. They will also be very interested in your SOPs and entry procedures because they will want to protect themselves from uh, other people coming in mainly, uh, coming in from countries where disease is, it has been quite bad. So if you are offering a safe environment and um, uh, a well-organized system, that will be appreciated and it will be noted and people will look for that, tour operators will look for that before they begin to um, plan trips. Um, so I can see that uh, there are good programs coming on in Uganda and 
and certainly for me it's uh, well up, very well up my list uh I, I spent a lot of time in rwanda some of you know that um but i want to get to uganda uh, um, very soon so yes thank you a great program uh, some great ideas and uh some really good thoughts about um and, and work going on engaging local communities. I can see there's obviously a few problems, there always are, uh, but uh, as long as the problems are recognized and worked on, then uh, the, the, you can only make uh, good progress. And that's great to see. I've done some work with schools uh, uh, around Kinji and uh, just outside volcanoes. And they are hugely, the children are hugely receptive. And there's here's an idea, perhaps it is, a reward to a 14 year old as they hit their 14th birthday, they get a chance to go and see the gorillas and how many would appreciate that and how many would enjoy that and they would become committed conservationists, I'm sure. So thank you, Herbert. Great talk. I'm looking forward to meeting you someday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilary. That's fantastic. It's very, very important for all these people you see here who are involved in two operation and conservation to hear from the other side uh, of the continent and, of course, uh, from the touristic uh, side to know what you feel. And uh, this has given us uh, more energy now. I'm sure Dr. Ho and all these people who are here are now more energized on making sure that we do our best. Uh, we still have an opportunity. We have been performing very well in the country. We've tried to manage the spread. It hasn't been so bad in this country. Uh, so far, we are still lucky, no death yet, meaning that we could be among those countries that would be uh, on the bucket list for travel. And that's very important. And really, thank you very much, Hillary, for giving us uh, that honest uh, observation of what you are doing. Uh, this, this program has just started as a result of the untimely death of Rafiki. Uh, it's a campaign called Never Kill a Mountain Gorilla. We just launched it today. We shall be announcing it and we are going to change the timing because there are many other people who would want to come and listen to these experts and it will be done in the afternoon in Uganda, like three o'clock. That's where we have some point, uh, a number of people from Asia, from South America and uh, parts of the world that would be uh, within um, their time. They can listen in and discuss and it will be uh, next program will be coming next week, at the end of next week. Uh, it will still be centered on the conservation of the primates. And we shall invite everybody to have more experiences because I know these experts you see, Dr. Rojo, uh, Bernard, Dr. Gladys, and all these people who do sell gorilla tours, like you see Mark, there's uh, Edison, there's so many tour operators here, and all these guides who take the tour operator, I mean, the tour is there. Our colleagues from Kenya, the guys in Rwanda, we all do this thing, but we want to know how can we do it best. This is the very time we must understand the SOPs. What do we share? So the SOPs are going to help us to convince and give proper information to the potential tourists who want to come to our countries. It's very, very important that we share this information from the experts and be able to translate it in the language that we understand and share it with the people for the future business. I'm really, very, very happy that most of you responded in time. Uh, this has been fantastic. Uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Kalema in just one minute to say a uh, wrap up words and then I will ask Dr. Rowe to close our show. Uh, Dr. Rowe has been, uh, is representing the Dr. Masawa here who represents the ED of Ghana Wildlife Authority. Do, uh, Dr. Kalema, please one word uh, to wrap up and when we go to Dr. Rowe, you are welcome. Gladys. Yes, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me better. Can yes, you hear me now? now? Yes, can you, you hear, can me? hear me now. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much for organizing this very great forum. And I hope we can join when you're training the guides, the same way that we got together to train the park staff about all the COVID-19 safety rules, preventing COVID-19 among people, from people to gorillas. All of us are happy to join Dr. Ruho, Dr. Sebide, and us. Um, me and my team at CTPH, we're very happy to join. And I think that's a very good next step from this forum that we have here. Event of excellence, uh, as Robert saw in Namibia, that's good to have for Uganda to have one. And it's great that Hillary could join us all the way from the UK. 
And we hope to see her in Uganda one day, hopefully when the, in the new norm of the COVID, post-COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you all so much for keeping positive and we hope that we'll continue to solve all these problems as they come along together as stakeholders in conservation and tourism. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalema, and thank you very much for accepting to be with us all this long. I know it's uh, not easy, you're not feeling well, but you managed to be with us. And I uh, thank everybody who has been with us uh, from the beginning. I know you have learned a lot, uh, you have contributed, and uh, of course there are lots of uh, contributions on the chat room. Uh, we cannot uh, do everything there. We shall definitely uh, attend some of them. And Dr. Roy, you have been doing very well at some of the questions. And thank you very much. And uh, this has started, as I have told you, it's a program developed at Bad Uganda Safaris uh, called Never Kill a Mountain Gorilla. And we're going to extend it. We want to add a voice to Uganda with the facility, a voice to all other conservation organizations to make sure that people, you know, we, we appreciate this uh, resource that God gave us. And so that we, 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 we utilize it profitably and without hurting it. Uh, Dr. Ruho, allow me to hijack you once again, and you're able to close this uh, discussion. Uh, I know you have the best words uh, to, to, to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I thank everyone really for staying, uh, listening in and participating so well in this uh, discussion. It's been a very nice uh, <clears throat> opportunity for us to interact with you and also to get this feedback. I think what COVID is teaching us as humanity is that really we need one another. And I'm very sure that uh, together we shall weather through this storm. I know there are so many lessons learned and unless we are not uh, really uh, willing to learn, but I think one lesson that has stood out very well, respect for nature and also being good stewards for nature is what really has come out very, very strongly in this uh, COVID crisis. So together we shall come through the storm. If we stick together, we shall overcome. And I think this is a moment where everyone is really, really important for us to come out positively through this uh, crisis. The tour operators, you know, you really, really carry uh, the, the biggest burden on your shoulders on, on marketing this country. And we still count on you that even as we merge out of this storm, you still carry this same burden and carry the positive news that still Uganda is open, is, is, is open to welcome them when the borders are open and when the airport is open. And also, we are also relying on you as ambassadors of conservation because it's not only the economic value that the tourism carries, but the sustainability of all our actions, tourism, because we want to make sure that the generations to come continue to see this wildlife. So we thank you so much. We cannot overemphasize the importance of community in conservation. We will do all that we do as Uganda Wildlife Authority because of the communities, because a community is everywhere. And it is for the communities that we conserve this wildlife. So the communities, we urge them that they continue to see this wildlife as theirs and they also work together so that we become good stewards of this wildlife. And above all, I'm also looking forward to again enjoying the wild as I used to enjoy it. I am missing a free travel to the wild because that's where I belong. That is my home. And uh, I we also look forward to seeing people like Hillary to Uganda and keep telling, keep telling everyone when the borders are open, please come to Uganda. We are looking forward to receiving you. We are looking forward to giving you the best experience. And finally, I want to thank you Herbert, so much for the, this initiative because you see through this crisis, we need to keep talking together. We need to keep thinking together because there is no single human being from what we've seen in this COVID that possesses all the solutions. So thank you so much for bringing us together and we look forward to more interactions. Thank you so much and I wish you all the best. Yes, uh, okay. 
Yes, Dr. Roth, thank you so, uh, so much with those closing remarks. I want to thank once again my, all my people who came in from Europe, uh, from South America, from Canada, from uh, Namibia, uh, Kenya, Rwanda, uh, from Australia, and from Uganda. And of course, the guides. The next session will be looking at business community. We want to invite the business community who said, I mean, Gorilla Tours, people who are investing in conservation. We will invite them here. Uh, next week, uh, it is possible that we shall be announcing so that they can also contribute and we let them know that let us drive a campaign. Let us not kill the gorillas. Let us conserve the gorillas. What message do we take to the community when we are in the communities? How do we show them that we appreciate the, the gorillas? That when we go there, we give them jobs. We never tell them this. They don't seem to understand it. And you know, surprisingly, these people who kill gorillas live in the community. They live there. They live in the communities, but sometimes they, they never talk about it. They know they were hunters, but they never talk about it. So we will continue running this program. I want to thank uh, Uganda World Health Authority staff for this urgent response, because like JJ was just last night, uh, Ru, of course, was just yesterday, and most of you just came in. Uh, thank you very much. Let's keep together. I've been from Colombia. I enjoyed the Colombia when I was there. I'm coming back. Thank you so much. And... Let's have the best of our time. I always remember to go and see the gorillas when they open. I know they will open soon. Uh, of course, if it is next day, it is still soon. As long as the, the, the safety measures are, are, are followed, and we shall all meet there and track the mountain gorillas and enjoy them. Have a great day. Have a great night. Have a good morning. Bye-bye.